still digesting the second live practice that was available to the media this week during Penn State football training camp. Welcome to the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. Nate Bauer, Senior Editor of Blue White Illustrated, with me today. Nate, we're going to do it, right? We're going to talk about the running backs, and we're, we're going to declare this competition open after two minutes of watching them, right? We're, de we're definitely uh, doing that. I'm going to declare it over. Over? Two minutes. Yeah, it's over. Two minutes <laughs> was enough. I saw all I needed to see. I'm ready to make a judgment. Let's go. All right. I, we're going to dive into that here on the BWI Daily Edition. We're also going to talk about the quarterbacks. And uh, we're really just going to round out kind of the offense in general because you got to go over and check out Phil Troutwine, work with yep. the uh, with the offensive line in person. I, uh, I'm a little jealous I didn't get over there, so I need to get your information. I'll be getting it at the same time you are here on the BWI Daily Edition. Nate wrote his quick hitters after training camp on Wednesday. It's up at bwi.rivals.com. And if you want that information, we're just going to give you tidbits. Uh, Nate, somebody was complaining the other day that when we talked about the impressions of practice, we didn't give all the impressions. That's because you got to go subscribe. That's the this is the this is the hook. We got a little bait on it for you. You need the full thing. Bwi.rivals.com backslash subscribe. It's it's kind of funny because I, I can't shut up. So uh, <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be very challenging for me to withhold anything that I think. But you know. We'll we'll see what happens. You know, well, uh, that's that's we'll navigate through those waters when we get there. But as always, subscribe here to the YouTube channel and to wherever you get your podcasts for the BWI Daily Edition. So let's get into it. Uh, the running backs, we got to see them up close and personal. And uh, first things first, they look like what you're used to seeing from Penn State running backs, right? When they you saw them up close, they look like the guys you're used to, Miles Sanders, Saquon Barkley, Journey Brown. They're back to being those guys on the field. Yeah, I would I would actually say bigger. Oh, bigger. On the whole, on the whole, because I actually went back and looked at the numbers uh, a little bit. Penn State has always had a, you know, a change of pace kind of kind of guy like a change like an under 200 pound guy uh, or a guy that's right around 200 pounds Penn State doesn't really have that anymore uh, I mean these guys are all 210 220 in some cases 230 pounds um, they, they just look big to me and and what's striking is that Noah Kane looks small next to Kevon Lee like he, right I, I mean I, I don't know they all look big but I, I'm just saying I mean that just the size on the hole within the room uh, is really impressive especially uh, you know when the little guy quote unquote in the room is his nickname is tank <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's bringing right. some thunder too yeah like the like the little dude in the room is tank Smith who tips the scales at like 235 I think yeah uh, you, you know so they, it's just it's a uh, physically a very very impressive uh, group but I think it raises the question that a lot of Penn State fans have which is who's who's the speed guy right like who, yes. who's the guy that who's the guy that's gonna break one for 80 and this has been what I've been down? this is what I've been pounding the table about because I don't I don't I don't see it necessarily as one two three on the depth chart because that can be redundant. I look at it as who's got the skill sets to come in and do the different things. And that also includes pass protection. That includes yeah. who's going to be your third down back that's the best receiving back. We got to see a little bit of that at practice, just some, you know, some drills and things like that. But that was what surprised me. Not that anyone looked better or worse necessarily, but they all looked so good at it. Uh, yep. Kevon Lee looked good at times. Maybe both him and Noah Kane are a little bit big, but Kaziah Holmes and Devin Ford coming out of the backfield both looked lean and fast. And I was, I was my guy in that horse race uh, of who's going to be the speed back is Kaziah Holmes because as you mentioned, there's no yep. small guys, but there are smaller guys. And Kaziah Holmes has now, I think, overtaken Devin Ford. He's now up to two ten. He looks like it. He's he's complete all the way through. He's a guy that when when you looked at him on tape as a as a high school senior, you saw the potential for growth, and you saw he had the body type for it. He's really put in that work, and now I think he's ready 
to challenge for that role in this in this offense, and that would be, I think, the best case scenario when you look at the two and threes. That way, you've got that mix of skill sets. It's gonna be it's gonna be interesting though because they've got a, a couple of guys that I don't think they can ignore. Yeah. What What are you? I guess are you really in the Kane uh, and Lee fan club when it comes to who's gonna be getting the majority of the snaps, or how are you looking at? I, it? Yeah, I mean, I, I Noah Kane is is really interesting to me because really the middle of his freshman season, right? Uh, and that's that's kind of like the whole picture um, is you've got these these multiple storylines with the, the the running backs, one of which is, hey, nobody has separated. If someone separates, they will get an opportunity to do that, right? Like there there is an opportunity out there to actually take hold of it and be the guy. They haven't yeah. had that since Miles Sanders. Obviously, Sanders was following uh, Barkley, right? Like, so, so you're coming out of this recent era where you have had some feature backs, some, some guys who you knew were going to get the ball 15, 20 times a game. Yeah. They haven't, ha- they haven't had that since then. You, you don't so, think that Journey Brown turned into the guy at the end of his season? Do you think he would have been I, had he played his senior year? But the, but, the, but the funny part about Journey Brown doing that is that it was by default because Noah King got hurt. Right. That's fair. That's a fair point. Uh, and so, and so, yeah, Journey Brown turned into that. But even going into last season, if Journey didn't get diagnosed with the medical condition that he did, and and obviously, you know, I mean, it's it's really too bad uh, for his career to have to end like that. But had that not happened, they were going into the season still with Kane and Journey as one A, one B. That was that was the setup. Was those two guys had clearly separated themselves from the rest of the pack, but they had not separated themselves from each other. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't. It's it, I'm curious to see if Noah Kane, who did take the job his true freshman season, right? So much so that he finally got the start at Michigan right. State. Only to immediately get injured. Yeah. If 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 that's the opportunity, right? Is it, can he not only go back to being that guy, but being better than that guy, and then asserting himself as having separated himself from the, what is a crowded crowded room, right? I mean, there's just there's a lot of talent in there and a lot of um, ability and varied ability, yeah. uh, you know, that Penn State is just going to have to navigate and figure out, you know, what they want to do and how they want to do it. But I don't think, I, I will say this, uh, and then I will stop talking. <laughs> I don't I don't think that they want to be in purgatory. Uh-huh. I don't think that they, I don't think that they want four running backs where, and, and I mean, obviously James Franklin said it last night that they want three. Yeah. But there have been situations in the past where the fourth or the fifth were too good to keep off the field. They, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, they, they had to, they had to figure that out because otherwise, uh, you know, one, you're not gaining anything necessarily by keeping that fourth person off the field. And two, if you do keep that fourth, fourth person off the field, they're probably not going to be at your program much longer. So that was the next thing is, do you think, as this shakes out, and, and we're talking to Greg Pickle yesterday here on the Daily Edition, uh, he says that he thinks there's going to be some separation, some we're going to start to understand who's making headway in those battles as we get into the weekend where there's likely going to be a scrimmage, and that starts to set the table for who's in the pecking order and where. Do you, do you think that guys will start considering that and you might see somebody transfer in the next two weeks or so? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I to me, that seems like um, not a great spot to put yourself in as the player doing the transferring. I, I don't know yeah. what you gain by seeking out a transfer a couple of weeks before the start of the season. It feels like if you you can't play, right, like, so right, yeah, right. But if you were going to do that, it seems like it would have made sense to do it in the spring yeah. or immediately after the season. Um, but Indiana lost a running back today, just today. So, um, yeah. you know, it, 
it uh, it's just one of those situations where, um, you know, yeah, I mean, these guys are going to have to make uh, choices of their own. But when you look at the depth chart and see five guys who all, you know, are, are kind of vying for carries, one of which is a graduate transfer, right? Mm-hmm. So John Lovett, I, I don't know. He's not going anywhere, obviously. Yeah. But yeah, they're they're you know they're going to have to navigate that and figure it out for themselves. It's an it's an interesting situation where the injuries and I said this a couple weeks ago on on the daily. You the the flow was interrupted last year so dramatically by what happened to Journey Brown and then Noah Kane because you wouldn't be in this situation this year with especially Kevon Lee. Where yeah. you had your power back in Noah Kane, who was going to go into that season, and uh, was he was he a true sophomore? He's a true sophomore last year, right? So yep. we'd be heading into likely if he had the season everyone expected of him, into what is the deciding year of whether or not he's going to the NFL, whether he yep. can leave as a junior. You have a redshirt yep. freshman in Kevon Lee, who is a similar skill set, who's had that year to develop, and you have questions about, you know, excited, positive questions about what he could be. Now you got a log jam because you've got your guy that you just described, Noah Kane, that was the he took over as a true freshman, yep. and and has not been healthy since then. Now you've got Kevon Lee, who proved he could hold his own in the Big Ten and won that position, albeit a little bit by default. Let's let's call it what it is. Want to yeah. by default because Devin Ford didn't step up and take that, which also leads into that conversation of now Devin Ford, he where is he on the roster? He's been here for three years now, so is is that gonna cause him to start looking elsewhere? So you, you had this big interruption because of those injuries last year that put you in a good and a bad situation because you do know what you have in Kevon Lee, but you kind of wish you knew it this camp, not in the middle of last season. So that that's the interesting nut of what we're talking about here. That's the that's the thing they got to crack open and figure out. How do you think it worked out as far as? And I know we kind of cover this already, but how do you really think it works out when it comes to the distribution of carries in a game? And don't forget, the quarterback is going to get carries as well. Do you think they're really going to go to that lead guy if Noah Kane is who he says he is? And can, the better question here to me is. Can he stay stay healthy? Do you think Noah Kane can get through the first month of the season healthy? Yeah, I, I do. I, I don't. I mean, I, I guess that there are guys. Some guys are, are prone to injury. I, you know, I think that that's a label that coaches definitely, on behalf of their players, don't want guys to get hit with. Sure. Right? And so, sure. And so, and so, Jaywan Sider on Saturday at Media Day really roundly rejected that about him being fragile. He was like, dude, mm. this, guy's a tr- this guy's a truck. Uh, you know, he had a freak. He never got injured before his freshman year at Penn State. In high school, he wasn't injured. Came, comes to Penn State, does outstanding stuff, took the job, and then just has this bad break of a high ankle sprain. Yeah, and then comes into 2020 and has this opportunity uh, again. You know, as a result of what happened with Journey, but to get injured the way that he did, um, uh, Cider said it. He was just like, "Yeah, he was. He was trying to fight for a couple extra yards." I mean, the game had just started. Yeah, it was his know, four, third carry of the game. Third <laughs> carry of the game, fourth <laughs> offensive play of the game. Yeah, and. Which kind of shows you what the plan was last year for Noah Kane if he ran the ball yeah, three right. of the first four plays. That's that's a frustrating situation. But, you know, we've visited that part time and time again. Um, when To round this out, if you are looking at positional skills, do you think that Noah Kane has enough to be that third down back where he can get out in the passing game? Did you see enough quickness from him? Did you see enough ability there in the brief glimpse that we got that he can be that complete guy? Because if he is, I think that that answers a lot of these questions. I mean, he, cer- he certainly looks good right now, right? I mean, you know, just yeah. given given the context, given that we haven't seen him in so long for very much, right? I mean, like the last the last real memory that any of us have is of him in the Cotton Bowl. Yeah, and he did he did pretty well in the Cotton Bowl. He had ninety two yards and two touchdowns in the Cotton Bowl. So, you know, he has come back from injury before. 
we saw the social media post this summer of him working out. He, he looks good. Um, you know, I, I'm not at the, the, I don't have the eyes that you have for hip movement and, and, <laughs> you know, his, his footwork, but uh, it looked good. Yeah. It looked good. He looks like, he looks like a beast to me. He so. always looks smooth. That's the thing. That's the thing. Noah Kane has always been able to do is as big as he is, he always looks smooth. And to me, that was the the minute contrast I saw yesterday, albeit in just a small sample size, was when they were coming out of the backfield. Uh, Kevon Lee looked a little bit, still a little rigid. Now much better than he was last year. But when you compare those two guys, I think that that's the biggest difference is that Noah Kane is super slippery and fluid. And if he can uh, be more of a presence in the passing game, yeah, he could be that complete third down back that can do all of it. It'll be interesting to see if, if he if he dominates the touches, what that does to the rest of the roster. Well, and, and, and if even if he only goes back to holding form, James Franklin's assessment of Noah has always been that you just know that you're going to get five yards at him. Yeah. Every time he touches the ball, he's, yep. he's going to fall forward. It doesn't matter where he gets hit. Uh, he, he is, he has the power, the ability to move the ball forward. And so, you know, this notion that you're going to be in a lot of third and longs, which is exactly what happened to them last, last season, they found themselves behind the chains uh, and off schedule so frequently offensively that they didn't have third and short situations where that would have made sense. Um, you know, so yeah, I, 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 I think that he is, he has the ability to be a complete back. Um, you know, it's just, it's just a matter of these next couple of weeks are going to be interesting to see one, if anyone else can really displace him for no matter what happens, even if they have three backs that they all split carries evenly with, can anybody displace him from being the first back that's on the field in the game? Uh, and two, can he can he be can he make himself one period, and then there's two A and two B, right? Because I don't I don't see I don't see that happening either. Is I don't see a one a two and then a bunch of guys all fighting for three. Like it seems very clear to me that you're either going to have three guys who they find they're comfortable enough with to split carries, you know, it's not, it's not carries, it's possessions, right? So possessions evenly with, or you've got a one who gets the bulk of the carries or, and the bulk of the possessions, uh, and then a group that, that kind of figures out that second spot. That's a, that's a really good point. And uh, Nate Bauer here with me on the Blue White Illustrated Daily Edition, but also the regular Blue White Illustrated it's out right now, and Nate, tell us a little bit about what we can find in the magazine. You see the uh, the cover here today looks pretty dope. Tell us what's inside. Yeah, I mean, getting ready for kickoff, right? I mean, yep. you know, the, you've got a couple of weeks left until uh, until this thing starts, and so it's it's really the primer. It's really the uh, okay. We we had we did the preseason issue. We had that you know the features and all of those things but now it's okay here's what this team is going to look like here's here is how we're expecting it to go predictions all of those kind of things uh are in there and so yeah it's it's a great issue it's uh it looks good yeah it looks great and i think that uh if you are interested bwi.rivals.com backslash subscribe and you can get all of the information about where to find that bluewhiteonline.com also not too late for the BWI uh, preseason magazine as well. 2021 Penn State football preview issue here, 166 pages, bluewhiteonline.com or 800-421-7751. Uh, a lot of great stuff. You guys have put in a ton of work into the magazines. Uh, we're holding it down here on the social media, YouTube, podcasts. We got you covered here for Penn State football season. It's in full swing. And the thing everyone wants to know, Nate, this is the, the this is the deal of what did you see from Sean Clifford? <laughs> and there it is, right? Right. Well, I I held off for ten minutes. I wanted right. to make sure we gave some time to the running back so that I could once again profess my love for Kaziah Holmes and his legit breakaway speed, and we could talk about sure. No Kane. Sure. But it doesn't matter if Sean Clifford doesn't have command of the offense. 
part of it is what you saw yesterday, but what are you hearing from your sources about how he's been conducting himself so far in camp? What, what have you heard about Sean Clifford and what he's done so far this year? Uh, all right. So, you know, there are, there is a difference between being good in shorts and a t-shirt and being on the field. We all know this. This is yeah. not, I'm not saying anything revelatory here, but in shorts and a t-shirt, Sean Clifford looks great this preseason. Yeah. Um, I I think that so much of Sean, and like, I, I hate to go down this road because it, it, it gives me more power than I deserve in terms of reading people. But so much of Sean Clifford is about his headspace and the way that he carries himself and his demeanor, right? Like yeah. he, he, he is a person who when confident and playing confidently can do very good things. He, he, I mean, look like, the, Indi- the Indiana game last year is obviously a, a, a sore spot for Penn State fans, but he let and and in his own case, he created a hole for them or helped create a hole for them that yeah. they had to dig out of. But he dug out of that hole. Yeah, he, he did. Great. He played a yep. really good second half of football. Made plays at critical times, uh, both with his legs and with his arm, that were key to them even having an opportunity to win that game. Uh, And so that's the Sean Clifford that if you can eliminate the mistakes in the first half of that game, you will take his stat line from that game. And not not just the stat line, but the, the way that he did it every time you will take that version. The, the problem for him is that when the train gets rolling off the tracks, it, it, jumps off the tracks into a ravine and everything blows up. Yeah. The forest lights the forest lights on fire. Nobody survives. There are no survivors. It is as it is catastrophic as that can get. There's no lucky sort of and everyone was saved because X. It's it's as bad as it seems. Yeah. It just it right. And so and so what I've seen from him, and I've been talking about this all summer, I I, I mean and and it feels precarious for me to continue to talk about it because if he goes out there and looks terrible and carries himself terribly, then it it says that everything this summer was a mirage. But to me, I, I have seen a guy who buried the past. He buried last year. Yeah. He has he has done all of the things and that's not that's not just my impressions. That's what you know other people who have seen him. You got to talk to him yesterday, right? So what was he like and, and what did he discuss? What was he asked? How did all of that go? Somebody asked him about 2020 and he literally said, hey, uh, I, I'm sorry, but we're, we're done here. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, it, it's over. Like, we're, it's just, there's, there is no sense in talking now in August 2021 about what he learned from November 2020. Yeah, because he already learned it or he didn't, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so to him, there's no benefit of like, how, how many times can you, uh, y- you know, hit yourself over and like this complex of having to acknowledge your faults and having right. to, to, to pay penance for the mistakes that you've made in the past right. at, as, a right. fo- as a football player, right? Like that, I mean, that's such a huge part of, of what this entire ecosystem is, is, Hey, you know, how, how can you improve this year? And yeah. I'm as guilty of it as anybody in terms of the media. Like, hey, what are, what are the ways that you're looking to improve this year? Well, it's not just what – there are two tones to it. One is what are the ways that you're looking to improve because you're constantly seeking improvement? Right. But the connotation is also, hey, what are the ways you're looking to improve because I'll tell you what, if you don't <laughs> – Because it was bad. Because it was – It was, it was bad. Yeah. <laughs> this isn't this isn't gonna go well, right? So yeah, right. Like uh, so for him, I, I I saw a guy yesterday who, and 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 throughout the summer, who has carried himself confidently. Mm-hmm. He has confidence. He believes in what Mike Yurcich is doing at, at offensive coordinator and as the quarterbacks coach. That process, Sean Clifford loves the process. He yeah. loves the minutia 
of all of this. He just he yes. loves football, but he he really very much gravitates towards. Hey, if if I'm doing this, 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 and this, and can find the smallest little details to improve upon daily, it's gonna pay dividends on the field. Yeah. Well, I've always That's- said he's he's the kind of guy that can tell you all the answers. Like, I not that I can whiteboard, but like I can speak very basic football on their level, right? And I bet if I if if he had a conversation with somebody like me or somebody like you know, somebody who, who knows enough football to ask the, those kind of questions, he'd probably blow you away with how much he knows about football. And he probably, yeah. every coordinator that's come in has been impressed with his work ethic. They've been impressed with his knowledge of football. It's always been about translating that to the field. And that is the part, that's the that's the intangible part of playing quarterback and, and being great at something, right? Not just, you know, knowing the answers, but when the test is here, do you deliver? And he has been inconsistent at that part. So it's on, I guess the question is, can Mike Yursich help him find that last ingredient? And there's one thing that when it comes to Mike Yursich and and the transition to this new offense that I'm curious about is, yes, it's the third in four years or whatever it is, five and six or whatever it is that for, for Sean Clifford, but the whole time James Franklin has been here. And not that he has been having a tremendous say in the last two offenses, I think. But how much does him being here and trying to ease that transition, whether it's keeping verbiage the same or translating things and helping that quarterback get on on, on an even footing in the new offense, how much is that critical instead of having a completely new staff and learning everything from scratch again? I I think it's very critical. I I don't think there's any question about that. The... James Franklin says the same thing every time, and and uh, I, I believe him that all of these guys are familiar with at, by this point in their careers, right? They've been they've been through enough that they understand all the concepts, yep. you know, right? It's just like yep. Uh, there are only so many route the, combinations and coverages you can run. It's it's a chessboard. The yep. the pieces don't change what they can do right it's yeah. just how you use the pieces and so that's what it is for an offensive coordinator is they're deciding which pieces they're going to rely on the most how they're going to utilize those pieces that do very specific things uh in in the order in which you do it the the um obviously the play calling itself but this these are the concepts this is how you're going to execute them so i i do think that there has been uh a continuity to what they've done uh, from a, hey, here, here is, this is what the play looks like on the whiteboard. However, Mike Yersich has this ability to wrangle Sean. And I think the, the main thing for Sean this season is getting him to remain disciplined more yeah. than anything else. That's the word is discipline is when, when the fire comes in, are you going to hold to what your foundation is and yeah. all of the rules, right? All the rules. Like that's what it is. If this, then that, yep. at that position specifically, yep. are you going to hold to those rules or are you going to freelance? And yep. what we saw last year and, and it's funny, I, I mean, I, there was a moment from the 2019 season that for whatever reason remains ingrained in my head. And it was Penn state was seven and zero at the time and was playing at Michigan state in another typhoon, right? Yeah. It was raining. It was crazy, whatever. Penn state was in control of the game, but didn't have a huge lead. And in the second half, again, up ahead enough, Sean Clifford's in the backfield. Uh, they're on Michigan State's side of the field. He's scrambling around. He's right, like doing what he does and uncorks one. Opposite side of the field. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like a, a 60 yard throw. Like in real yards, it was like a 60 or 70 yard throw into the wind, the rain coming down, right? And, yeah. and got intercepted. Yeah. And after the game, after the game, and so he didn't. He had not had an interception in that game otherwise. 
And after the game, James Franklin, you know, basically came up uh, in the press conference and when evaluating Clifford's play that game, he just said, that's not who we are. That's not how we play this position. That's not what we do. And lo and behold, last year, I think a lot of what you saw in terms of when things went off the rail for him had something to do with that, with that, that concept of, Hey, things weren't going well in nearly every one of those first five games, things were not going well from the onset of the game. Yeah. And so here's a guy who loves to make things happen. Just wants to make things happen. That's his, that's, that's who he is. And it's a big part of why he's been successful in the past. Yeah. But, but if you break too far away and are freelancing too much and, and forget your rules and forget the, the standards that brought you to this point, you're going to find yourself in trouble. And yeah. so Mike Yersich very much, there's a long way to make a point, but Mike Yersich very much seems like a guy who is going to drill you to death about maintaining that integrity, maintaining those standards, maintaining those rules. Uh, and you're not, you're not going to do that. Like he doesn't want to see that. And if you do, you're going to find a place on the bench very, very quickly. Yeah. And so there's a lot, uh, again, even that, you want that aggressiveness in your quarterback. You want that guy who wants to put a dagger in the other team, and he wants to be the one to do it. It's just that if it's not there, it's not there. And yeah. that was that was a big part of, of 2020 was it was not there a lot. And then when it, was, yeah. when, when it wasn't there, sometimes it wasn't there, and sometimes he didn't see it. And that's, that's the part that I think was the biggest problem is that once it wasn't there, his his uh, his blinders kind of got on, and he got very narrow focused on a couple of things. So you're right, making him comfortable in the rules, in in the process of the offense, allows you to then break the rules. Like you have to master the rules before you break them, right? You're never just Johnny Manziel in college, for an example, never worked in the NFL because he never learned the rules. He just was freelancing the entire time. Guys that are successful at the highest level of doing that are masters of the game first, so they know how to manipulate those things. And Sean has elements of all of that, but it's you're right. It's being able to operate at that efficient level first. And that's going to be key uh, through the football season. Also key through the football season is you getting more of this information on a daily basis, and you can do that now. Also, if you notice here down below, you have this awesome offer. This is the Blue White Illustrated promo code that we're running right now. Uh, where you can get two months free. Nate, how awesome is this deal where you just, you, you got to sign up and then you get two months free. So basically half the season, right? I love it. I think it's great. I think you have something to do with this? Uh, I had everything to do with it. I, I <laughs> pound the drum. I said, give the people two months free. That's, that's see, what we did. He's that's here. We did. It's great. He's here for you uh, when when he wants to give you information and he wants to give it to you. He wants to get you good deals. So Nate, on with us on the uh, BWI Daily Edition. One last thing I want to talk about the offensive line because you got to go watch Phil Troutwine coach for the first time in person. Right, this is the first time we've yep. actually got to see him do his job. And I'm desperate to know what was that like. What did you observe from Phil Troutwine? I'm desperate to hear your thoughts when you get to see him because I'm just watching a guy who very calmly and coolly seems to be that technician mold, right? Mm-hmm. Like it, I, I said it yesterday, but I play golf. He reminds me of a golf instructor who's, he witnesses the technique, sees what it is, and then aligns your head and things that you're not necessarily focused on in the process. He says, Hey, if you do this, 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 and this, uh, watch your feet. You're, you're going to put yourself in a better position, right? Yeah. As opposed to I'm, I'm used to through the year, particularly on the offensive line, you know, that that's a spot where position coaches are barkers. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's all about it's, it's all about drilling like a drill instructor with your feet and the timing and your hands and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you're talking again, about. Again, again, yeah, and and this was not that that I saw yesterday. It was very uh, in a composed manner, just you know, let, letting each guy take the reps. Not there's no anger attached. There's no 
uh, volume control issues. It's just, hey, here's what you do. Here's what you did. Here's what you need to do. And here's how we get there. Um, and so I, I thought I thought it was very technique driven mm -hmm. uh, and something that on an individual level. And again, now it was an individual period, but you, you weren't looking at the whole. It was, hey, here, here's each guy and giving that personal attention uh, to get them in the right spot at the right time. And, and he's talked about that, too. You're, you're right. He said it's a lot like your golf game. And, and he meant in the sense of you can be good at one thing, but if you don't have a, a complete game, if you can't putt or you can't drive or you can't hit your wedges. And by the way, I'm super proud that I said all of that correctly because I don't know anything about golf. But uh, <laughs> but he said if you don't have those things, you can't be a complete lineman. And, and he did. He talked about getting better at those minute little details. It might be the most technical position in all of sports, uh, more so than the quarterback when it comes to the actual – technical parts of the position because your feet and your hands have to work together it's and i've said this before in some of my videos uh scouting some of the prospects also having good posture is kind of unnatural because you're you're kind of leaning back if you've ever done a squat at the gym properly at first when you're doing it you feel like you're going to fall over and that's kind of the posture that you need when you're playing line especially in pass protection so having balance and having your hands and all that working together you have to you have to have so many of those things dialed in and that's where i think penn state has been lacking on the offensive line has been they've been good matt lime grover was a good offensive uh line coach he was a good recruiter but it felt like there were at times there was more to give rasheed walker is a guy that is immensely talented and if if phil troutwine can work with him this off season in the spring in the fall into this year i wouldn't be surprised if he had a career year and he has a chance to be an elite level tackle. That's the, the sort of thing that if you pay attention to the details and you have that talent, then you can get great production out of the offensive line. And at the college football level, if you can dominate up front, that is one area you can take an advantage from another team, as we've seen in the past with Penn State on the flip side, where they've been dominated by elite defensive tackles on the interior because there is some more disparity along the offensive and defensive line than there is in the NFL, and you can make real advantages there. And Phil Troutwine has proven over time that he can do that with guys. He can make that a strength of the team, and it's not just about bullying guys up front and dominating the trenches and running the football. It's about finding those advantages and making sure you're taking advantage of them. If you are a Power 5 program, that can get a guy like, like Rasheed Walker or in the long run a guy like Landon Tangwall who has that pedigree. So, uh, you know, I'll be down there with you next time watching him work because that is, to me, the next level for that particular unit. Is there anything else you picked up from maybe how the players responded to it? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I'll just tell you what the drill was because I'm, I'm curious to know your impressions of it. He was – they were doing a um, – they were doing pass sets mm -hmm. and, you know, kind of very deliberately shuffling uh, right to – they had – Four cones set up, mm -hmm. one on the left, straight across and back on a 45 degree angle and mm -hmm. back, and then on maybe a 60 degree angle and back, right? Just kind of simulating uh, that. And what they were doing, they had their arms parallel and had a, like a heavy bag uh, on that they had to prop on both arms, right? Yeah. So they're in, they're in position, their, their, their arms have to hold this bag up and then maintain you know, the right, um, the gaps in their steps and, mm -hmm. and, and hit these cones. Uh, yeah. and then after, and it, you know, it, I'm, I'm making some educated guesses here, but I bet it's a little bit like swinging a heavy bat before, uh, you know, before you get into the, the batter's box, right? Yeah. Like you, you, because then they take off the, the heavy bag and they do the exact same thing. And now you don't have that weight on your hands and your yeah. arms. Well, but it's also about be... keeping your hands in that position and not losing to a defender who's trying to swipe them down or grab them. Gives you that strength to know like, okay, this is how it's supposed to feel. This is where they're supposed to be. And also yep. you have to have them up. I've seen so many guys who try to pass protect and they get outside and their hands are like this. And then it's like, how did I lose? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Come you on. didn't use half of your body, maybe that part. So that's, you know, that's interesting. That's so that, again, that's the technique stuff that it's, it's not just the, it's not just the basics. It's a, you, the more you can get advanced on that 
and the more you can teach those guys, and the young guys especially, if they can pick up on that stuff while the pressure isn't on for them to perform, that's when you start to get the ball rolling downhill on getting guys that are ready to step in immediately and become contributors, and there's not that worry about, oh, you know, can he handle X, Y, or Z? There's always that unknown, but it's a smaller percentage. And this is where, where I think Penn State, when they made this move, uh, and maybe they took a step or two back in the last two years, but really, if you remember in 2017, 2018, I had the conversation, when is it going to be um, the expectation is that Penn State will reload versus when they have to worry about losing X, Y, and Z at a certain position. Because certain programs, you don't worry about it. You just expect that Ohio State's going to have the next edge rusher or they're going to have the next receiver or whatever. And part of that is recruiting, but part of that is development. So I think that that's where Penn State can find an advantage here is getting those guys and developing them so that you're not thinking, okay, who's the next guy looking around wondering. It's more, okay, who's the next guy? You expect the positive instead of the negative. And that, that was, honestly, when Phil Trowine got to Penn State, that was one of the first things that he said was his excitement, and I, I don't want this to sound disparaging, but his excitement was not to work with Will Fries and Mike Mennett, right? Like, yeah. good, guy, good guys, and, and it's, yeah, you, you, you love them as people and as football players, but you actually get to mold Rasheed Walker. You don't get to mold Mike Mennett at that point in his career. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, really, because at that point, the more that they've been taught through their college careers, the more you have to break down to get them where you, you know, like they have to yeah. unremember things. You have to and unlearn so, bad habits and, and relearn what you want them to learn. Yeah, ex exactly. And so, yeah, it, it's it is helpful to Phil Troutwine that some of the better players and the more highly regarded prospects that they've had on the offensive line are in these younger classes, juice scrubs, right? Yep. Like you, you, you've got guys who one have a few more years to play. Yes. But also have not had a different teaching for four years that you're having to compete with among the best intentions, right? Like you can come into it. If you're, if you're that guy in your fifth year and yeah, you want to do everything that the new guy is telling you to do, but it's hard. It's hard to unlearn. It's hard to, to, to unremember some of those things. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that that is very much the point and that's very much the potential is, Hey, when these guys come in as, as true freshmen, there one Penn state as a program is in a situation now where they don't have to play right away. Yep. Uh, yeah. Right. You have some experience. That's one of the things that was the first thing that he talked about on Saturday when asked what the strength of this offensive line is. He said it's experience. They've been they've been here like they they have experienced something. It doesn't mean that they're. Fifth year guys, all of them are fifth year guys, but they have all played so much. So much of that too deep has all played in meaningful snaps, meaningful games. And that's that's helpful. That's helpful to have been through that process, even that they went through last year when, yeah, things did not click. They, they yeah. never had a chance to in yeah. the first five games. They never had a chance to. They, they just, without a preseason practice, a real preseason practice, without a spring practice, to have done that snap to whistle rebuild of an offensive lineman's technique, it was never going to happen until the live reps started. And guess what? Spring practice is ugly for a reason. Yeah. Well, Penn State's spring practice on the offensive line last year was in October. And <laughs> yep, that's exactly and the, right. And, and the games counted. They, were, yep. they went into the record books, right? So, yeah. But, but having, having gone through that and, and making your way through it, you know, I think that, that everybody there, players and coach, feel a lot more confident. They yeah. feel much better about where they are this season. And to bring it full circle, an improvement along that group makes things easier for the running backs and makes things easier for Sean Clifford. The more variables you can eliminate at that position, the more chance that guy has to be successful. And I think, more than anything, this has been super successful. Nate Bauer, Senior Editor, Blue White Illustrated with me on the BWI Daily Edition. Thanks for coming on. I always enjoy having you on. Thanks so much for having me. This is great. Appreciate it.
We'll be back on Monday with the BWI Daily Edition. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and to YouTube. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. We'll be back then.